Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this afternoon's Learning Collective session with our guest, our presenter, I should say, Julie Dirksen. Thank you for joining us, Julie. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to hop on this session and share with everyone in our L&D community um, your knowledge about VR and AR in order to affect behavior change. This is a perfect topic after Andrew Hughes session this morning on using different uh, solutions and tools for VR training content. So it was a perfect segue into your topic. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Julie is someone who probably does not need an introduction, but for those who are not familiar, familiar with her, I'm going to uh, help you familiarize yourself with Julie Dirksen. She's a consultant and instructional designer with more than 20 years experience creating interactive e-learning experiences for clients ranging from Fortune 500 companies to technology startups to grant funded research initiatives. She loves brains and games and evidence-based practice. Her MS degree is in instructional systems technology from Indiana University. And she's been an adjunct faculty member at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and an e-learning guild, Guildmaster. She wrote the book, Design for How People Learn. And she's happiest whenever she gets to learn something new. And you can find her at usablelearning.com. And then without much further ado, Julie, I'm going to put your presentation up and then we'll get started because everyone came here to hear your session. Okay, great. Um, so uh, yeah, if uh, people are in and have access to comments, feel free to uh, make comments or ask questions or anything like that as we go along. So um, it's always nice to it's always nice to be able to see what see what people are wondering about. Um, uh, so this presentation came about because I think a lot of people have been uh, looking at the question of this kind of technology and trying to understand better about what's the business case for actually making use of things like augmented and virtual reality. We've obviously been talking about them in the industry for quite a while, and we're starting to see some use cases, which is great. Um, you know, we're sort of in that in that section of the hype curve where we're moving out of everybody saying this has enormous potential into saying things a little bit more along the lines of like, hey, here's some ways that we're actually making use of it. So that's super exciting. Um, but it's not a small amount of effort right now. I mean, you know, I know Andrew was talking about tools earlier and um, there's starting to be some things that are kind of considered authoring tools, but really a lot of the implementations are still things that require a development team and people with some expertise in these areas. And I think particularly good impl implementations of it. Um, and so when is it worth it from a business point of view to make that kind of investment? Um, one of the, you know, things we've definitely seen sort of discussed and other people have talked about this a great deal, so I'm not going to get into it, but, you know, obviously it's a great tool when um, trying to put people into realistic environments is too dangerous or too costly or too hard to replicate. Um, you know, those are all clear business cases. Anything where, you know, the simulated version is less expensive than, you know, the real thing. So um, a colleague of mine is uh, looking at it for, you know, it's an enormously expensive kind of clean room technology for chip manufacture. And, you know, the, um, uh, the devices, the actual devices are so expensive that, that, you know, spending time on augmented reality solutions or virtual reality solutions really is a cost effective way to look at creating more realistic training environments. Um, oh, we've got a couple of people here. We've got Don and we've got Kevin. Yay, fantastic. So anyway, uh, those are those are some of the clearly established business cases for augmented and virtual reality. But if we look at it, there's actually some really interesting research going on in some other areas. And the question is, you know, where might it actually be a more effective medium than um, some of the other possibilities than like doing a video thing or doing, you know, some other kind of multimedia presentation. Uh, and the answer is not conclusive yet, but I think there's really some interesting research looking at where we can go with this. Um, so this presentation's a little bit more of a kind of summary of what uh, is out there in the research literature right now. And obviously it's being added to all the time. Um, I will not pretend that this is 100% up to date because there's new stuff coming out and I think you'd need to be um, 
I think you'd need to be basically focusing all your attention here in order to make sure that we're getting the absolute latest. But I do think that there are some big trends that we can absolutely look at. Um, and I'll just mention that when I originally did this presentation for um, uh, Realities 360 for the eLearning Guild, um, I did it with a co-presenter, Dustin DiTomasa, who's with an agency called MadPow. Um, and he is a, easily one of the smartest people I know on the whole topic of behavior change and technology for behavior change. And actually he and I are working on a book on um, designing be behavior change interventions right now. So hopefully sometime in the next year, we'll be able to actually, you know, put that one out in the world. Uh, but anyway, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, if I can get this. Okay, there we go. Um, so we've got these challenges in the organization and in the broader world. Um, and one of, and I won't kind of get into too much of that now, but but one of the things we look at when we look at a behavior change intervention is really this sort of logic model, right? We sort of say, here's a problem. So for example, um, you know, a problem that people have a really hard time wrapping their head around might be something like the impact of climate change. And then we look at what kind of intervention could happen around getting people to change their behaviors around climate change. We need to make sure that we're being really specific about what the behaviors are. Um, then we look at a mechanism of action. So what what are sort of, is it persuasion? Is it training? Is it skill development? Is it incentives? Is it restrictions? There are all these different you know, mechanisms we can use to impact behavior. And then we try to make sure that we're identifying a really good target behavior. Um, and this is a super important point because I think this happens in a very vague way a lot of the time. And that's why a lot of behavior change efforts um, fail. So for example, I will talk to a client and they'll say, we want our people to be more customer focused. Well, you know, the question is, what are what are the behaviors associated with? I think we all have a picture in our head of what being customer focused looks like, but it's one of those things where I really want to know, um, the dog is going to join the session here. Um, it's one of those things where I really want to know um, where, what exact behaviors do we mean when we say be more customer focused? So is it, uh, you know, referring a customer to, you know, a different store to get a product? Or is it um, how they greet the customer? Or is it, um, you know, specific actions that they take during a customer interaction? So being able to kind of get to behaviors. And the question that I often ask when people are saying things like be more customer focused is, if I took a picture or a video of somebody being customer focused, what would I see? What kind of um, behaviors would I be taking a picture or video of? And not every single behavior is something you can take a video of. Sometimes it's a cognitive thing that's sort of invisible, but but a, a lot of times that sort of shakes free the, the discussions of, of actual behaviors. And then we think that those behaviors will lead to that outcome. So if you have a population that you want to... Um, uh, improve their diet because they're subject to type 2 diabetes, we think that X number of behaviors, eating so many fruits and vegetables per day, is going to have um, an impact on the outcome, which is to reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes. And sometimes we're right about those, um, you know, sometimes, and then obviously for healthcare things, it's pretty well established. Um, sometimes you're, you're operating with a little bit more ambiguity. I think this behavior, I think if this salesperson does this thing in this sales call, we're going to get an outcome of increased sales. But we don't really know until we test it out and try things. So, um, so that's kind of the um, specific, uh, you know, kind of flow that we're working with. And then we really want to look at the target behaviors. Are there things in augmented or virtual reality that are going to increase the likelihood of desirable target behaviors or reduce, you know, undesirable behaviors? Um, so if we kind of keep looking at this, um, another one of the underlying models that we really, uh, that both Dustin and I used um, is uh, this one, which is Combi. And basically this is from Susan Mickey and her colleagues who are based out of University College London Center for Behavior Change. Um, and what they did is they did a research uh, survey across all of the different behavioral models. I think they looked at diff 19 different models that had emerged and said, well, these are all kind of covering bits and pieces of behavior change, but is there a way to bring them into like a single comprehensive model so that we're kind of dealing with um, 
you know, one thing, thing from sort of start to finish. And so, for example, there might be models that work specifically on motivation or models that work on um, persuasion or, you know, things like that. But can we bring it into a single kind of meta model, I guess, is, is what it would be. And what that is, is this, which is capability, opportunity, motivation. So is the person capable of doing the behavior? Do they have the physical capability? Do they have the psychological capability? Are they motivated to do the behavior, the M in COM? Um, and we look at both reflective motivation, which is motivation that the user could probably talk about. So if we ask them about their values, what would they tell us? Or if we try to understand things about what they identify with or feel strongly about or goals that they have, those would all be examples of reflective motivation. And then, you know, we also look at automatic motivation, which is all those sort of unconscious things that are happening, um, habits we're not necessarily aware of, uh, feelings, um, by cognitive biases, all of those sorts of things. And then we also look at opportunity. So what's the social opportunity? How well does the social environment support the behavior? And then physical opportunity, which is how well does the physical environment support the behavior? So these are all some of our really underlying models that we're thinking about when we're looking at behavior change. And when we looked at the research literature around AR and VR for behavior change, we really found a couple of themes uh, emerging. Um, one was uh, experience and consequences, and I'm going to talk about each one of these. Another one was feedback mechanisms. Another one was uh, projecting yourself into the future, which is similar to consequences. Another one was empathy building, and another one was emotional regulation. And so I'll talk about kind of each one of these. Um, I do want to put a caveat about this. This field of research is very much emerging. And so some of the examples in the presentation are, hey, this is interesting, but they don't actually have a lot of, they have little or no kind of outcome data. So it's worth looking at the phenomenon, but um, but we can't, uh, you know, we can't concretely say, yes, we, we're confident that this works in, you know, a rigorous study condition, like a randomized control tile. Um, we also have some studies where uh, they're also really interesting, but they're small. Um, there might be anecdotal outcomes. They might be a small pilot, uh, a small pilot project with a relatively you know small study number of participants in the study. So again, super interesting to look at, but not necessarily like something that we're going to pin, you know, a really significant investment on without further investigation. And then the last category is we do have some things where, you know, there's a bit more research out there. There's a bit more of a robust study effect. Um, I would say that the technology, um, the technology and also the research efforts are changing a lot. So I, I do expect this, this whole area to evolve. So this is kind of a snapshot of where we've been in the last year or two, but not necessarily the, you know, all of the answers going forward. Um, so one of the first big themes it, it, that emerged was this idea of experience and consequences. And so really what we're wondering, you know, bottom line is, if, for example, I take a safety a safety problem, right, um, and I tell people, hey, it's really important for you to wear your safety goggles because these bad things can happen, versus an instance where you can have some kind of virtual experience of the bad consequence happening. Are we going to see a behavioral difference between those two conditions? One where we just kind of tell people versus one where they go and get to have the experience directly themselves. And this is the idea of what, but one of the big questions about this is um, how much of an, uh, does this impact people's intentions to do things? And then also how much does it impact their actual actions? So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Um, I, I use this analogy quite a lot. Um, this is from Jonathan Haidt's book called The Happiness Hypothesis. And he talks about how your brain has all of these older parts of your brain, which are feeling, they control your physicality, gross motor control, fine motor control, reflexes. Also, you're like, right in the middle of your brain, you get the emotional fight or flight, you know, the, all of those kinds of things. And then way up in front, we have a little part of our brain, um, prefrontal cortex, that is arguably the sort of location where a lot of logic and reasoning happens. And one of the challenges there is a lot of intellectual approaches to only talk to this little rider up here, your prefrontal cortex, versus talking to the elephant who's much more concerned with how things feel, uh, both how they feel physically, but also how they feel emotionally. And that the messages that go to the rider, 
hey, it's really great if you eat better. Don't always make it over to the elephant who really, really loves French fries. So one of the, the interesting possibilities in augmented and virtual reality, and in particular the virtual reality, is can we create experiences that don't just influence the rider around the intention to behave better about certain things, but also really kind of convince the elephant that they, you know, that, that change is necessary. Um, so, for example, with this, ha, you know, we have lots and lots of people who know that texting while driving is a bad idea, and but we also know that texting while driving happens, still happens quite a lot. I mean, hopefully it's happening less. I haven't actually looked at the stats in the last year, but, um, but one of the big efforts around this is one of the big question marks is if somebody has the experience of being in an accident while texting while driving, is that going to reduce the likelihood of um, people actually texting while driving? And the answer is we're not, we don't have a lot of outcomes on this one, but this is a program that AT&T did where it's one of those, you can do it on your phone, you can do it with like a Google Cardboard or something like that, where you can go through and have this sort of experience of what, what it, an accident caused by texting while driving feels like. Um, and they do, uh, it's unfortunately not a behavioral measure, but they did get tw over 25 million people to sign up to pledge not to text while driving as a result of the campaign. So it, that's not an insignificant number of people who are, who have at least um, stated an intention not to, not to do this thing. Um, and hopefully it's having an impact on actual behavior. Um, uh, the Norfolk Police Department in the UK did something similar where you can kind of go through this whole experiment. Um, and, you know, they, the question is, does the intensity of the experience have a bigger impact on, um, you know, kind of, again, that sort of emotional, visceral self as opposed to your intellectual self? Uh, and in fact, there's businesses, there's a company called InnoCorp that does this for lots of things. They have um, these simulated um, driving experiences for teenagers where they can, you know, and obviously this is virtual reality, but it's kind of a virtual reality in that they're simulating what it would be like to drive um, impaired, you know, if you're drinking or something like that, where they simulate with the uh, controls of the car in terms of slowing the brakes and um, making the steering wheel not as responsive as it would be ordinarily so that you can feel what it would be like to drive impaired. Um, and we also have some things like this was a study where they looked at the question of whether or not fire safety, if they did it as a virtual reality thing, um, was a uh, you know, was um, going to have a bigger impact on students' uh, fire safety behaviors. They didn't, they found sort of similar pre and post test results between a more intellectual condition and a more um, virtual reality condition. But we do know that, that one of the things they found in this test is that there was more engagement with the, with the thing overall when it was in a virtual reality. And so there is a little bit of the, it's a sort of knock on benefit with shiny object where people are more willing to like spend time and engage in environments that are more interesting than, you know, a, a PowerPoint lecture or something like that. Um, this is one of my favorite studies though. This is one that came out of uh, Jeremy Balenson's lab at Stanford. It's the Virtual Human Interaction Laboratory. And um, uh, if you're in Palo Alto, you can go, they, they open it up for tours once or twice a month. Um, uh, and it's free and it's totally, you know, it's really fascinating to actually go do these. Um, and this is one of my favorite studies that they did there. They were looking specifically at environmental behaviors. So they wanted to know, would people use less disposable paper if they had, um, uh, if they had a more visceral experience of the consequences of that paper use. So what they did is they talked to both groups about, you know, use this much paper and um, this many trees get cut down. And what they found, and then they put half the group into a condition where they were kind of learning about cutting down trees in a sort of intellectual fashion. They were reading about, you know, the impact of cutting down trees. And then the other group went into this virtual reality environment that you can see in the video here, where they were cutting down virtual trees with a virtual chainsaw. And um, when the tree would fall over, like the floor would shake and it would make a big, you know, rumble and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so, what I, my favorite part of this study was the fact that <coughs> both groups came out and they asked, said, will you change your behavior in the future? And both groups said, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, it's Northern California. They're an environmentally aware population. So 
we didn't find a difference in people's intent. They were expressing about the same level of intent to change their behavior. But then um, by accident, quote unquote, they would spill a glass of water while people were leaving the room and they would count how many paper pieces of paper napkin they used to mop up the spill. And in the cases where people had been in the more visceral condition with the virtual reality condition, they used almost 20% less paper than the people who had just been into the intellectual condition. And so this is, I think it's super interesting, right? Because we seem to, um, we know that there's a difference between people intending to do the right thing and people actually doing the right thing. And so a, a VR study where people where by having that more visceral um more visceral experience, uh, it, you know, actually caused the behavior to change, um, even though the intent was the same, is fascinating to me. And now it's this, they, they've replicated the study a few times, so it's had, they've had a few iterations of it, but it's still one study and we can't overgeneralize from that too much. But I do think it's a fascinating area. Um, when I was touring the lab, uh, I did the VR simulation where you, um, that you're in this room and you're in a carpeted room and it's, you know, it's got, it's, you know, it's a very safe space. There's no, you know, like there's no objects around and they put you in this VR condition and they open up a pit in the floor and you get a tiny little piece of wood that you can walk across. And I was fascinated by the fact that I could not step out on the plank. It's this plank test, right? And so there's this huge pit and you have to walk across this incredibly narrow plank, even though you know perfectly well, like intellectually, you know that you're not standing above a giant pit. And it's not even like, it's it's kind of primitive graphics. It wasn't even all that polished. I mean, the, you know, your average video game has much better now. But But my elephant was so determined that this was absolutely a terrifying idea to step out on this tiny plank over this huge pit that my rider could not drag it out. I had to look at the ceiling and then I could make myself step forward. But if I was actually looking at this pit on the floor, I couldn't make myself step forward. And I think that that's a, a clear example of this sort of visceral difference between um, this visceral difference between what you intellectually know and what you're feeling and experiencing. And so figuring out ways to leverage that feeling and experiencing around some of our more difficult behavior change uh, problems is a really potentially interesting area. Um, they've used this quite a lot for safety sorts of things and seen some good initial results. Uh, I need to go back, actually go back through and look at the stuff from the last few months, but, um, but generally it's been, it's been positive. Um, you know, so there's a number of different companies that are trying to, to look at this. Now we do have a problem with these in that we need to be somewhat careful about how graphic these experiences are. Um, so you can have a safety thing that goes horribly, horribly wrong and you could have a very visceral um, outcome to it, but you do need to kind of observe sort of reasonable ethics about what it's okay and not okay to sort of subject your users to. Um, this is a one that was done for um, uh, home healthcare workers uh, a, in terms of identifying hazards in different people's houses. And so it was about um, uh, looking at, you know, looking and seeing where are there, you know, are there rugs on the floor that people could slip on? Are there, um, you know, things in the bathroom that could be dangerous for, you know, an elderly or disabled uh, client or, you know, things like that. Um, and so uh, this one is another safety one. It's Harness Hero where you sort of suit up and then you can push your little person off of, this is actually a phone app. You can push your little person off the thing and see if they survive. Um, and so, you know, it's not even particularly virtual reality, but it is this sort of nice simulation thing where you can fi figure out what the consequences are of certain certain actions and certain kinds of things. So if you use the harness that has the torn grommet on it, um, your person could like, you know, the harness could rip free and your little person falls to the ground and dies. And that's about probably, I think the level that I'd be comfortable with in terms of graphic consequences. It's not a super bloody example, but, um, but you know, that's, that's obviously part of the conversation. Um, they did find that when the visuals were more pronounced, this was a um, this was a place where they were comparing two conditions. One was just reading the safety card for exiting the airplane, and the other was experiencing a virtual reality version of the um, of the uh, 
you know, virtual reality version of having to exit an airplane. And obviously I think you can just see a little bit at the top, there's a bit of blood around the hands and stuff. So they didn't, they didn't totally pull their punches. Although again, not horrifyingly graphic. And the main difference they found in those is that um, the results seem to persist in terms of, they're actually measuring knowledge, not behaviors, because like obviously you can't simulate um, plane exits, but they were measuring how well people retained the knowledge that they gained in both scenarios. And, um, in the case of uh, the more visceral experience, the knowledge that they gained in that one was more persistent a week after the study um, than the one which was more of just reviewing the safety card. Uh, and this was one that they did for uh, fire evacuation. And what they looked at is they found that they had a lot more arousal. Um, they were measuring things like abonic skin response, heart rate, um, uh, you know, some other stress markers. And they found that they were looking at um, putting people through, it was, I think it was virtual reality in both conditions, but one was virtual reality where they were just kind of navigating the, the fire evacuation route. And the other one was virtual reality where they were navigating the fire evacuation route um, uh, with uh, fire and smoke in the simulation itself. Um, obviously it's simulated, so it's not, you know, not actually dangerous. Um, so people had more stress arousal when they were in the condition for, um, that had the simulated fire and things like that. And again, it's not totally conclusive, but the supposition there is that they, those people will be a bit more prepared for the stress of an actual, um, an actual ev evacuation because they protect it. You know, they've, they've practiced in a, an environment where some of those stress indicators were also present because sometimes even if you've learned a thing, um, stress can cause you to revert back to more practice behaviors. Um, there's a, a researcher out of the University of Eastern Lancashire, <laughs> um, Sarita Robinson, who's found that uh, she's looked at stress reactions around learning for people who are doing helicopter um, uh, helicopter evacuations where you, you know, like a helicopter crashes in the water and you have to be able to get out like HEAC training and found that, you know, people will revert back to more known patterns when they're under a lot of stress. Um, and so for example, they'll try to um, unfasten their seatbelt where they're used to unfastening their car seatbelt rather than in the center of their chest where um, the helicopter seatbelts are um, and things like that. And so it's possible that having a higher stress environment to learn the behavior is gonna increase transfer if you're in a higher stress environment when you're actually needing to use the behavior. Um, so, so there's a lot of really nice stuff kind of happening and coming up around this question of does experiencing the behavior, you know, does it having a more visceral experience of it actually sort of transfer the behavior into the real world? And does it create potentially better performance, especially, like I said, if you're in a, you know, in a higher stress uh, environment where you need to um, apply the, apply the learning. Um, another big, uh, another big piece of what was trends in the research literature was feedback mechanisms. Um, and feedback mechanisms, the idea that by having more feedback, you're going to have an impact behavior. And I think that this is generally true. Um, I think that the biggest single commonality across everything that I would consider to be a behavior change problem is absolutely um, a delayed or absent feedback. Almost every behavior change problem that you're ever going to see is delayed or absent feedback. We absolutely know this in... Um, our current situation. So people who are choosing not to, um, uh, not to, you know, follow the self social distancing guidelines around COVID and things like that. You know, one of the big issues is they don't immediately know that they've been exposed to somebody because people can be asymptomatic. So you don't get any feedback of like the visual cues of somebody sneezing at you or something like that. You um, are not going to get sick immediately. So they don't know that that particular behavior is the thing that caused a problem. You may, you may get sick and not know it, or you may not be sure that it's sick because you can't get tested. And so there's a whole slew of feedback problems that are operating um, for us right now, uh, you know, that are causing are causing our current situation to be really, really difficult. Uh, and so looking at some different ways to improve feedback mechanisms. So this was a study that was looking at um, water usage. And so if the behavior is we want people to use less water when they're showering, 
you know, I mean, you kind of know how much water you're using in the sense that you know how, how long you stay in the shower, but you don't get real data and you don't necessarily have a direct assumption. And so what this was, was a mechanism that was going to provide a visual feedback while you were taking a shower and tell you if you were using a little bit, a medium amount, a lot. Um, uh, not in this study, but in some other studies around electricity usage, they've also done then mapped you to the norm. So you can see, am I taking a longer shower than most people who are like me? Or am I taking a shorter shower? Or am I taking about average? And that those can have an impact on behavior as well. Um, so with this particular one, they did find that adding in water usage, adding in this feedback mechanism actually caused people to use less you know, less water. They didn't, they didn't ask people to use less water. They just asked people to, to check their usage, you know, to kind of keep an eye on their usage while they were using it. And so naturally by getting feedback to this, a lot of people, um, uh, you know, started being aware of how much water they were using and used less while they were uh, study participants. Um, they did find, however, which is an interesting point that the the effect was only durable. So when they came back and talked to people after the study was gone and after the feedback mechanism had been taken out of their bathrooms, um, they, they found that the people who um, identified, pre-identified before the study as being ecologically conscious were still using less water, but that the people who had not identified as ecologically conscious had reverted back to kind of normal shower usage and things like that. And so there does seem to be something about like, if you're gonna do feedback, you know, it may need to be persistent um, or, you know, we may need to do more research to know if, if using it for a certain period of time has a durable impact. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. This is a, a Nakajima, who's a Japanese um, researcher. And I actually have no idea what Leiden Virda's or country of origin is, but um, that these are researchers who had done this where they were looking at these sort of, they were calling them ambient mirrors, which was something that was providing you feedback on actions that you were taking. And um, so this one was um, the, uh, uh, this one was uh, looking at um, the uh, teeth, teeth brushing. And if you brushed your teeth more, um, you could have a cleaner little virtual aquarium. And if you kept your aquarium clean for a longer period of time, more fish would come and live in your aquarium. And I think there's some stuff now out there in the world, uh, like some virtual stuff with, associated with electronic tool toothbrushes with kids where they can get this kind of thing. But they did find that it increased the length of time that people brush their teeth and it also, um, uh, it also caused people to, you know, maintain over more days. Um, when the feedback system was removed, it they did regress back to some of their previous behaviors, but uh, but there was still something durable about the effect. They still remained higher than their initial uh, their initial levels. So, um, so I kind of love this one. Uh, this is one that was done actually by Dustin's organization, MadPow, where they were looking at the question of whether they could improve people's adherence to physical therapy routines by creating an immersive environment with feedback mechanisms for it. So typically, you know, the uh, particular, this is Reflection Health is the company that they were doing this for. And what they found is that typically when somebody is doing, you know, recovering from an injury and they have to do physical therapy, they get handed a sheaf of um, Xerox copies and somebody shows them how to do the exercises once and then sets them home and that the adherence rate was not great. You know, um, I'm sorry, I totally have the stats on this slide, but, uh, but basically they improved their compliance quite a lot. I want to say like 60%, but I, I'm afraid you can't quote me on that because I, I should have pulled this stat before I did the presentation. But what they found is if they used, and they were using some of the, um, I can't remember if this was, um, the Microsoft, um, the Microsoft VR gaming system, but they just did it in the gaming system. So it's essentially a gaming thing, but basically it was like, uh, the game, like the virtual games where you could, you know, do yoga poses. And if you replicated the pose, it was going to watch you, your form and give you feedback on it. They could, they adapted those kinds of, um, gaming environments for specifically physical therapy, um, uh, physical therapy, uh, exercises and they really significantly increase people's compliance with actually doing their physical therapy and improve the quality of the physical therapy ex uh, exercises that they were doing because they were actually getting feedback on whether they were doing them right or not. 
Yeah, Tracy just commented, it's going to be interesting to see what behaviors we're doing now revert back to old after this global event. Because I think there's almost certainly going to be stuff that um, we, uh, that will persist after this, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and some things that we'll revert back to. And it'll be interesting to see which is which. I, I think it's going to be hard to predict right now. Uh, another uh, strategy that we saw represented in the research literature is this idea of future projection, um, which is, can I project myself into the future? And there's kind of two pieces to that. One is sort of having empathy for your future self. And another is a little bit of like taking those consequences that maybe won't happen for a while and kind of making them more real and more visceral for people. So it's been kind of overlaps with um, the consequences point. Uh, and it turns out we have a bad history of estimating how our future self is going to react. Um, these are some studies done by Emily Pronin and some of her colleagues, and she was looking at what people thought they might do in the future versus what they actually do when they're confronted with the reality of it. And she had two different conditions. One was people measuring people's willingness to dis to drink something nasty for payment. <laughs> um, it was nasty, like taste, it was perfectly harmless, but it was like soy sauce mixed with milk mixed with orange juice or something. And it was gross, but not dangerous. Um, and then uh, the other one was looking at whether or not they would save a financial um, you know, reward or whether they would kind of impulsively spend it. And in both cases, they sort of said what they would do. They thought their future selves would do. They said what they thought other people should do. And then we found out that, um, I won't get into the study design, but we found out that most people are, are, are more likely to sort of view their future self like they would view other people. You know, it's the do as I say, not as I do conundrum. Um, our, you know, we, we're very virtuous for our future selves. So if somebody comes around and asks me if I want a cookie with lunch and it's only 8.30 in the morning and I just had breakfast, I'm able to say, no, no, I don't need a cookie. That's fine. But if somebody comes around and puts a cookie in front of me at lunch and says, do you want this? Then um, that's going to be way more likely to be a place where I'm going to, you know, even if I've decided I want to eat healthier or eat less, you know, sugary things or something like that, that I'm going to probably going to fail on that. And that's a pretty consistent result. Um, the way the behavioral economists have used this is they, um, they, you know, try to get you to lock your decisions in for your future self. <laughs> How much will I save for retirement? Those kinds of things. But then we also look at the question of can you kind of project out for your future self? And the term that this kind of that comes to is important here is the idea of hyperbolic discounting, which is when we get a reward or punishment it has a big impact on how much we value that. So rewards worth the most now. And as soon as I start moving that reward or consequence out into the future, I start to discount that value. And it falls off pretty steeply in a lot of the research. This is based on some of the research done by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, who are sort of the you know grandfathers of a lot of behavioral economics. And what they found is that as soon as they push it into the future, you start discounting it pretty widely. So for example, if I said, do you want $10 or $11 right now? Pretty much everybody's going to pick the $11. But if I say, do you want $10 today or $11 tomorrow? When I do this with a whole group of people, I usually get mixed results, 50-50, 60-40. Some people are like, no, I'll take the 10 today. And other people are like, nope, I can wait. Um, but if I say, do you want $10 today or $11 in a year? Everybody in the room will take the $10, except there's sometimes one person who wants the $11 and then they want to talk to me about interest rates. So, um, so that's a case where it's the same amount of money. It's an extra dollar. Um, but as soon as I push it off of now and start to push it into the future, the number of people who are willing to willing to wait for that extra dollar starts to go down pretty steeply. And the truth is it usually flattens out after a while. So the difference between 12 months and 13 months is probably irrelevant. Um, you know, uh, so we've got this problem and almost everything that we struggle with is from a behavior change point of view has this. So if you start smoking today, the consequences for smoking may not show up for 20 years. It could be really bad. It could be death, but it, you know, it's going to be really delayed. Or if I start working out today, I'm not going to see physical benefits from working out for probably, you know, four to six weeks or six to eight weeks or things like that. So 
it's hard to persist in behaviors where you're not seeing any be immediate benefit or consequence. And the further out we push it, the more we decrease the likelihood that that behaviors, that reward or consequence is going to have an impact. Um, so this is a study that was also done at Stanford where they uh, took you, and it was like that uh, plugin that was floating around that I I think had problems, you know, in terms of privacy issues, like so many of those things, but where you could like age your, you know, age yourself, like take a picture of you and age it. So they would create and, you know, they would take your image and they would create a retirement age version of you. And then you could walk around in the world as your retirement age version, or you could view that avatar of yourself at retirement age. And then they looked at the question of, if you had been able to experience yourself as opposed to they did some avatars where you could do, you know, you were just different for some reason, but it wasn't an aging difference. And they found that there, if they did the, the version where they aged you, um, you were much more likely to make a more significant savings to your, you were willing to allocate a higher percentage of your income to your retirement savings. So just seeing or experiencing yourself at that age kind of gave you this sort of greater degree of empathy. Sorry, the, the dog is very excited about something. Um, uh, gave you this greater degree of empathy um, for your retirement age self and you're more likely or more willing to, to sacrifice some money now in order to take care of your, your future self in that, in that scenario. Um, and there's been quite a lot of these that have looked at it in terms of healthcare. So, for example, if you can see if I persist in these behaviors, what's going to be the benefit to me physically? You know, what could uh, what could I look at? This is medical avatar, which does this sort of healthy selfie where they, you can take pictures of yourself and, you know, play around with different behaviors. So if I continue to smoke or if I reduce my salt intake or if I exercise more or if I improve my diet in certain ways, you can see here's what here's what the negative consequences will be. Here's what the positive consequences will be. And that these have had an impact on people's choices. Um, so uh, I think I've got a slide in it later, but like if people see themselves running, they're more likely to stay on the treadmill longer. And if they see themselves getting healthier in those environments, Oh yeah, it's this one. Um, this was a study they did where um, uh, they just had these sort of virtual representations of themselves and they could either see themselves loitering around or running on a treadmill. And it turns out that just, you know, watching your virtual self run on a treadmill makes you more likely, um, whether it's social modeling or, you know, something else, um, makes it more likely that you will uh, engage in, you know, higher levels of exercise. Um, Another area, and Cindy Cindy Leach is here, and she's really kind of the expert in this space, um, is this idea of empathy building. Um, and we did a, a virtual research report for the eLearning Guild, and Cindy authored this this chunk of things. So she's the she's the expert on it, but I'll talk about a few of the examples on it, which is just this idea of can. Um, as somebody who's maybe providing services to a certain population, can we increase the empathy that that person has for that population by letting them walk around in the shoes of, you know, walking around in these virtual shoes for a little bit. And so this is the Agnes suit, um, which is a suit that people, uh, and they'll use this with things like medical residents and so forth who are treating elderly patients. Um, some of the feeling of what it's like to walk around in an older body. So they make your knees stiffer and they weight things and they um, uh, limit your, your mobility in terms of how easy it is to move your head or your arms and um, the yellowing um, to simulate kind of the impact on vision and things like that. Um, so that, you know, a, 27 year old medical resident maybe can have a little bit more empathetic, you know, especially, especially if you've got a younger person who hasn't had a lot of experience working with elderly patients can have a little bit more um, empathy for the physical situation that they're in and kind of adjust their expectations appropriately. And so they, they have them go through some of the lifestyle simulation. So telling somebody that you need to go up and walk around more, you know, you may convey that message in a different way and that this, these things overall have a positive impact on treatment when people can be more uh, cognizant of the conditions that they're, the, the population they're serving is experiencing. Um, these are ones that, uh, I think this is also from the, oh, this is uh, a simulator company. I've got the link down below, but what these are is different glasses that if you're treating 
um, people with different vision impairments, you can wear these glasses to get a better sense of what their vision impairments are like. So if it's macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy or cataracts, you can try these glasses on and it can give you a more visceral experience of what that condition is like for the, for the people that you're treating. Um, this one was one where they looked at um, having uh, people treating Parkinson's patients or people with the, the physical tremor. And so it's a tremor simulator. And so by doing it, you can try to do common household tasks like putting a pot of water on a boil and, and understand what the physical experience is like um, for people who actually have a, have a significant tremor. Um, I, and, you know, the idea that this maybe is better than just you know spending time with some of those populations but i think the emphatic message with all of this is that none of these are a substitute for spending time with people in those populations and really understanding what their issues are um this is a fascinating one uh we've kind of had i've seen some stuff bouncing around today about second life which is you know the the uh, platform that nobody uses anymore but uh but the the most, the simple, single most interesting thing that I ever heard of being built in Second Life, other than, you know, for recreational purposes, was um, a, a UC Davis professor was treating or was uh, teaching classes in psychology and specifically abnormal psych. Uh, do they still call it abnormal psych? Um, uh, and he wanted his students to understand a little bit about what the world was like for schizophrenic patients. Um, and so what he did is he created a virtual clinic where people, where his students could go in and walk around and experience the world in the clinic um, with a lot of the reported phenomenon that people with schizophrenia were saying that they have when they walk around in the world. So for example, you might be in the bathroom in the virtual clinic, looking at yourself in the mirror and all of a sudden your eyes might start to bleed, or you might walk past a poster that's suddenly filled with lots of words of profanity, or you've got a little voice in your head as you're wandering around telling you to kill yourself. And these are all based on actual phenomenon that patients reported. And so um, the, uh, you know, the idea of like having, you know, not just if you're treating somebody with schizophrenia, not just saying, well, can't you try harder kind of things, but having a little bit more understanding of the difficulty of walking around in their world. Um, this is a group out of the UK um, that has created a, a dementia simulation. So you can have a little bit of experience of what the world is like for dementia. And that's actually where a lot of Cindy's work has been done um, is VR solutions around um, uh, around that. And if you'd like to read more about it, I encourage you, I, I think we can probably put the link up for the the eLearning Guild research uh, report that kind of gets into a lot of a lot of those kinds of things. Um, this one was for conflict resolution, where you could kind of take the role of somebody who's, you know, maybe your antagonist and, and kind of walk around in their world a little bit. Um, this was another one that was done in the Stanford lab where you could walk around as an elderly person. What they do is you, you have this VR thing and they put a mirror into the VR environment. And so you can sort of see yourself and you realize that, you know, I'm walking around as an 80 year old, but once you kind of can see yourself in the mirror, people start to kind of get comfortable with the fact that this is my representation of me you know, as this elderly person, and then there's a sort of mapping function that takes place. And, um, uh, and that when people had walked around in the world as an elderly person, they were more likely to, um, uh, you know, they were let or so they were significantly less likely to agree with statements that involved negative stereotyping of the, uh, of the elderly as comparison to people who got, you know, walked around in a VR environment as a young person. Um, this was another couple of really great ones. One was about um, uh, an undersea reef and seeing the consequences of things. But the the uh, the one on the left was um, you could walk around the world as a cow in virtual reality and experience life as a cow, and it decreased the likelihood. You know, it increased the likelihood that you would say things supportive of animal rights and so forth if you got to experience the world uh, the world as a cow. Uh, and then the last area that kind of came up was a little bit different, and it's the idea of using virtual reality, your virtual environments as a, um, using virtual environments as a way to help with emotional regulation. Oh, I see Cindy put in the live comments the link to the research report. Thanks, Cindy. That's great. Um, and I, so, um, 
one of the, you know, one of the big things that lots of people struggle with is public speaking anxiety. And so they did um, some small studies which had some successful results where people um, could go in and uh, practice public speaking in front of virtual environments. So they know it's not a real person and that, that ex it, this goes to things like uh, exposure therapy for phobias and things like that, where um, they, uh, they're, um, through, you know, kind of repeated exposures, they can gradually lessen the anxiety associated with a particular, a particular item. Uh, and so in this one, what you could do is you could start with a small group of just a few people and you could work your way up to bigger and bigger groups to see if it can help you with your uh, public speaking anxiety. And they generally had good positive results from it. Um, this was an interesting one. This was a, a big treatment condition that they did called Snow World. And what this was, was for managing perceived pain for burn victims. And the way that it worked is that burn victims um, have to have their bandages changed, which is a horribly painful and unpleasant process. And, you know, it's necessary for their, their recovery, but, you know, is just, is really a difficult thing. And so they wanted to see if, um, uh, they do think that there's some benefit to being distracted when something painful has happened, that that can help you reduce your perception of pain, even if it doesn't reduce the, you know, the physical, the physical inputs and so forth. And what they did is they put um, half the group were playing, I think, one of the video games and the other half of the group were in this much more immersive snow world reality. So the cool association and those kinds of things. And the, um, uh, so then you can see the results actually in terms of, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the results. And in particular, like worst pain, unpleasant pain, time spent thinking, I realize it's too small, but those first three um, columns in the, in the bar chart, um, uh, the red condition is people, who, what people reported sensing when they were in, just playing Nintendo as a distraction versus the people who were in the snow world, re, you know, um, the still world environment reported less uh, perceived pain and um, did not spend as much time kind of thinking about how unpleasant the experience was and, you know, those kinds of things. And also reported significantly less anxiety as they were going through the process of getting bandages changed and things like that. And so it's a pretty powerful, like, Turns out that the virtual reality, at least in this condition, was a pretty powerful thing in terms of creating a truly immersive distraction from this. And we get into this for um, uh, things like phobias um, and, you know, somebody who would never let you put an actual, so sometimes when people have a big spider phobia, they'll, they'll get exposed to actual spiders as a way of exposure therapy to lessen their anxiety, but some people can't even contemplate doing that. They're just not going to participate in the study. So they were looking at the question of virtual spiders as being less less terrifying than actual spiders. Um, uh, and, you know, therefore they can get a higher rate of participation in in the actual exposure therapy when it's not a real spider. Um, and they used an augmented ver ver version of this for uh, cockroach phobia. So there's a version where you can see cockroaches crawling on your, your sort of virtual hands through the augmented reality environment to try to learn to, you know, do exposure therapy and get less less freaked out about cockroaches Although, you know, I understand I, I get freaked out about cockroaches, but I think it's normal freaked out and obviously a phobia environment where you're having actual panic symptoms and things like that is a really different problem. Um, and, you know, it seems to have some interesting impacts for other things. This was an augmented reality study where you could look at a cookie and see it is either smaller than it actually was, the actual size, or bigger than it actually was. And the question was, would people eat less if their senses, their input, their visual senses were telling them that they were getting more? So, um, and it there was some small impact on it. This is a very small study. So again, you know, but the idea that if I feel like I just ate a really big cookie, is that going to create a greater sense of satiety so that I want, I don't necessarily want another cookie after it, as opposed to ate a tiny cookie, feeling like you could eat six more or something like that. Um, and this one was a donut satiation, which was um, uh, looking at a virtual donut. Did that make you more or less likely to, to want the donut? So they've looked, they've done this with a few different a few different versions. Um, and then there's things like, again, with the anxiety is a big target for this. This is a device that you can get whereby um, 
uh, it's got a thing that measures things like heart rate and so forth, a little, a little indicator device. And if you can successfully calm yourself, you get a visual feedback in the environment of like the tree greening up and kind of creating by, by practicing calming things, you can create this sort of beautiful environment on it. So this one has the sort of emotional regulation, but it also creates that feedback mechanism for people around, around that sort of emotional self-regulation. And yeah, so that's, those are the, the five big themes that showed up in uh, when we were looking at um, augmented and virtual reality around behavior change uh, kinds of interventions and places where we can at least start to think about whether the investment in the technology at that level is going to provide enough benefit over and above what, say, a different form of media might, might do in the same circumstances. And we got a few minutes left, so if anybody's got questions, I'm happy to I'm happy to tackle them. That was a very interesting presentation, Julie. And I was freaking out over the spiders and the copter. <laughs> But you shared share that example. I thought, I wonder if there's one for cockroaches. Sure enough, that was your <laughs> because I hate cockroaches. I hate cockroaches. But, um, uh, but but it's more just as you mentioned, probably just that the hatred of cockroaches than than a phobia per se. Yeah, uh, I, we're not trying to convince anybody that cockroaches are pleasant. But obviously, if it's a <laughs> crippling phobia for people, we want to help them with that problem. Oh, absolutely. And I thought of great interest, too, was the, um, I think it was the Age Lab example you'd use where they had younger folks in a, a suit that really enacted what an older person feels and, and how um, they can't see as well and things like that. And I thought that was a really great example for empathy building. And they're wonderful examples that I'm sure many of us have not thought about as well for use of, of VR. And um, I hope that this research continues. I know you mentioned it's still, um, there's still a lot of research out there that hasn't been. Yeah. Been and in. I know there's, there's some new stuff coming up in the safety space that I, I have very good intentions about getting back around to reading, but I think that that's a really promising area for a lot of this. So. Well, thank you to everyone who tuned in and uh, commented and made comments. Um, if there's any questions, go ahead and feed it, uh, pop it into the comments below. We'll make sure that uh, Julie gets connected with the questions if you're watching this video on replay. As I mentioned previously in other sessions, this video does remain on the RISC Facebook page and is easily accessible at any time. So if we are, you know, happen to have a little bit of the insomnia that most of us are maybe suffering from now, um, you know, pop up this video. It's a lot of great, interesting information. And thank you so much for your time again today, Julie, and, and coming on and sharing your knowledge of this information with everyone in our L&D community. Um, we loved having you. All right. Great. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.